Welcome back! If you're just joining the series, you may consider watching the setup video so you're ready to keep coding and learning. In this video, we will learn essential CSS properties and how to use the class selector. Check the video description for a link to an article with the video transcript and code samples from this lesson. To begin this lesson, open our project in VS Code. If you are just joining us, you can download the starter project to catch up. See the link in the video description. In the terminal, type the start command, npm run start, to run the project. Then, open the index.html file. For this lesson, we will be styling the elements on this page. Next, open the style.css file. All styles created in today's lesson will be added here. Now that we're actively getting into styling, it may be helpful to arrange your screen so that VS Code is on one side and the browser window is on the other, like so. You may also wish to toggle the file browser to hidden by clicking the top left icon in VS Code that looks like two stacked papers. This will give you more working space if you've reduced the overall window size. In the style.css file, we had started styling our H1. Let's continue to learn about the rest of the common typography-related properties. But first, a quick note about our font family rule. If you are unfamiliar with typography design, the term sans serif may be new to you. Sans serif is a category of fonts where the characters do not have small lines at the end, and those are called serifs. Looking at our H1 compared to the browser default, you'll see that the browser default is a serif font. If we define serif or sans serif instead of a specific font name, then it is up to the operating system, as in Mac, Windows, iOS, or Android to name a few, to decide the font to use. Alternatively, we can define a font name. However, it is important to note that not all fonts are available across all operating systems. But there are a few relatively safe choices. See the link in the video description for more information. Another option is to use web-hosted fonts, with a popular free choice being Google Fonts, also linked in the description. We will explore using a Google font in the Capstone project. Okay, let's move on to more typography properties. The next common one is font weight, which has a value options such as bold or normal or a number such as 300, if supported by the font you're using. You may have noticed that the heading elements all appear bold. If we look at them with Inspector, sure enough, there is a user agent style sheet definition for font weight bold for all of them. For demonstration purposes, Let's change our H1 to use font weight normal, which will return it to an unbolded style. Save, and you can see a clear, thinner difference to the bold style. Next, CSS has a property available to change the character casing. So we can use text-transform to change the H1 to uppercase. While content in all uppercase is generally discouraged, if you must do it for design requirements, then the CSS method is preferred over actually typing in all caps. Following that, let's use a property called letter-spacing to give the character some breathing room. For this, we'll introduce a new unit of measurement. Instead of a pixel, we'll use what's called an M. An M is a relative unit and 1m is equal to the font size of the current element, and 2m would be twice the size set for font size. This means m will proportionately adjust for any font size value. For letter spacing, it's common to use a decimal value, and even negative values are allowed. Let's define letter spacing 0.03m and save. You'll see there's been a, just a touch of space added between each character in the H1. The H1 is starting to feel a little out of place, 
So let's add a rule as the first thing in our CSS file for body to set font family sans serif. Save, and instantly we have a bit more cohesion. Typographic styles set in the body tag will automatically apply to other HTML elements unless you've included additional rules on those other elements, like we have with the H1. With this update, we can actually remove the font family rule from the H1. Save, and you'll see its font family appearance is still sans serif. As we learned in the last lesson, the inherited box model for heading tags includes margin. Let's create a rule that selects all the heading tags and apply an updated margin definition. The M unit can be appropriate for setting margins due to the proportionate behavior previously described. Our selector will be all the heading element names separated by a comma, h1, comma, h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6, with the definition margin, zero space, zero space, zero dot eight five M, which is shorthand for margin top zero, horizontal margin zero, margin bottom zero, 0.85m. Save, and you'll see we've tightened up the margin around each heading significantly. The H1 still feels out of place, so let's bump up the font size of the other headings. We'll create one rule per heading tag. For H2, we'll use 32 pixels. On H3, 28 pixels. H4, 20 pixels. H5, 18 pixels and h6, 16 pixels. That wraps up the headings for this lesson, and we're going to skip the paragraph as there's nothing unique to add right now. After that, we encounter our a tag, and link tags do have a couple of unique properties. Since a link is interactive, it has what's called states, meaning different appearances based on the current state of its behavior. The first one we'll modify is the hover state, which appears when a user moves their mouse over the link. The selector for this in all states begins with a colon, so the full selector is A colon hover. We want to make the color a bit darker blue, and we'll be using the hex color format, which is created with the pound sign, followed by a three or six digit color code representing single or pair values for red, green, and blue. See the link in the video description if you'd like to learn more about the hex color format. For our hover rule, we'll add the definition color, pound sign, 1313A0. Save, and you can view the effect by moving your mouse over, or hovering, the link. There are a few more states for links which we will cover in upcoming lessons and the capstone project. We're not going to style the list today, but we had previously wrapped each of them in a div tag. So let's focus on the divs to learn some container styling properties. Before we get into the properties, we need a way to uniquely identify each of these divs. If we just wrote the selector of div, it would apply any style definitions to both these divs and any future divs we added to the page. Instead, it's time to add class attributes to each div. Class attributes are added just like other HTML attributes we've learned about. CSS classes are custom names that you create and that can be shared among multiple HTML elements and then used as the selector for applying specific rules. There are many suggested ways to go about naming CSS classes, but we're going to keep it simple for this lesson. Open index.html, and on the first div, let's add class equals, and in quotes, container. And on the second div, add class equals container space container dash dash raised. Let's first use the shared class of container for our first rule. Class selectors 
are denoted by prepending the class name with a period. So our selector will be period container. Then let's add the following definitions. First, we'll add border, which we learned about in the box model lesson, with the value two pixels, solid, blue violet. Then we'll add a common container property to alter the container background, which has several sub properties. But for this lesson, we'll use background dash color with the hex value F9, F9, F9. Future lessons will explore other ways of using background properties. Next, we'll use a property to round the corners of the box, and that is called border dash radius. While there are expanded options to set different values on each corner, for now we'll use one value to set the radius on all four corners, seven pixels. Finally, we'll add color blue violet. Save, and notice how the color value was inherited by the list text. Now let's create the definitions for the second class, container dash dash raised. We'll add one property called box dash shadow, which will define a shadow effect. Our definition will be three pixels, space, three pixels, space, eight pixels, space, one pixel, space, RGBA with parentheses, zero comma, zero comma, zero comma, zero point three, which means a horizontal or x-axis offset of three pixels, then a vertical or y-axis offset of three pixels, a blur radius of eight pixels, which causes the blurred appearance, a one pixel spread radius, which will expand the shadow size, and finally, the color to use for the shadow. This is our first example of using RGBA, which defines, in order, the red, green, and blue values of a color, with the fourth value being alpha, which creates transparency. An RGB value of 000 means black because it says use the least intensity for all colors. And an RGB value of 255, 255, 255 means white because it says use the highest intensity for all colors and 255 is the maximum for color range values. So our RGBA value will produce black that is dialed down to 30% alpha transparency. Transparency also means that any color under this element would be able to show through. Save, and with that rule in place, you can see that the second div has both the styles defined in container as well as the addition of box shadow, defined in container dash dash raised. This demonstrates the power of classes to share common reusable styles. It may have already crossed your mind, but it would be nice to have a bit of space between the two divs. We could add a margin top rule to the container dash dash raised, since that div is below the first, but that may not always be true. Instead, let's create one more class, margin dash top with the definition margin top 16 pixels. Then go to the second div in the index.html file and add the margin dash top class name. Save, and then congratulate yourself on learning some essential CSS properties and about the class selector. We will continue to expand your knowledge of these properties and new ones in future lessons. Stay tuned for the next video where we will learn about the CSS cascade, otherwise known as the C in CSS. Be sure to subscribe. Support this project on Patreon. The link is in the video description.